Welcome back to the Crypto Assets Conference 2021A. I'm very happy to uh, greet you back to our bracket on regulations, politics and the future of payment infrastructure. And I'm also very happy to welcome Maximilian Bruckner from the International Token Standardization Association, ITSA, who will give us a presentation now. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. So I will give a presentation on the international token classification by the International Token Standardization Association, um, which we see as a guidance tool for global token markets. Very briefly, ITSA, we're a Berlin-based, not-for-profit association of German law. We have around 250 international members. These are pretty diverse, so they range from corporates to startups and token projects, banks, exchanges, there's some universities, some law and tax firms and different industry associations. And actually quite a bunch of the presentations you've seen throughout the three days were by some uh, ITSA members. And all of these members have the combined goal of the promotion and the active development of comprehensive market standards for DLT-based tokens to increase transparency and safety in global token markets. And we try to do this with three standardization projects, the International Token Identification Number, the ITIN, which you can imagine as somewhat of an ISIN, like you have for securities, but for tokens, we have the International Token Classification Framework, the ITC, which I will speak about today, and the International Token Database, or token base. So what is the ITC? It's an expandable framework. Uh, we use it for the classification of tokens according to a multi-dimensional approach, namely economic, technological, legal, and regulatory dimensions. I will take you through it now. This is basically what it looks like. Um, you can see there are four dimension groups and six dimensions economic purpose, issuer industry, technological setup, legal claim, issuer type, and regulatory status EU according to the markets and crypto assets regulation. So looking at the economic purpose, this is divided into three classes. We have payment tokens, utility tokens, and investment tokens. For the payment tokens, we look at unpacked payment tokens and packed payment tokens, like fiat or asset-packed payment tokens. We have utility tokens split up between transactional and non-transactional utility tokens and investment tokens. So there we have categories for debt, equity, funds, derivatives, and so on. And we try to be aligned with the classification of financial instruments, the CFI. So as an example, we're looking at the DAI stablecoin. Um, this coin, for its economic purpose, is categorized as a US dollar pegged payment token, USD. Um, you can see kind of how the codes break down on the right. We begin with the dimension group E, economic, di economic dimensions. We move on to economic purpose, EP, and so on, payment token code 21, fiat pegged payment token, then code 01, and USD pegged USD. And this is nice because once you've classified some tokens, you can filter and search not only by your final code, but you can also, for example, filter and draw statistics based only on pegged payment tokens as opposed to the final classification. Now, in comparison, we're also looking at the maker governance token. This is a utility token. It falls in the category of non-transactional utility tokens, and it's a governance token because it's used for governance of the maker protocol. Moving on to the issuer industry, we have 35 different categories and subcategories, and it's based on the North American industry classification standards. We've adjusted according to some new industry trends. For example, we've added an industry for decentralized finance, decentralized computing, ledger interoperability, NFT-based projects, digital arts, just because, of course, these are not yet reflected in the North American industry classification standards, but nonetheless, they are a very important field in the token markets today. Again, looking at the DAI, we, we classify it as a payment services and infrastructure industry because it's a stable coin, it's supposed to be used for payment and services. In contrast, uh, the maker governance token uh, has the class decentralized lending, saving, and asset management, looking very much at the purpose of the maker protocol and its industry as a decentralized lending protocol. First, or the only technological I mentioned right now is the technological setup. We differentiate between ledger native and application layer tokens. We have blockchain native and DAG native tokens. And then for application layer tokens, we look into major protocols, and even further into token standards on these protocols. So for example, we classify tokens, whether they are ERC-20, ERC-721, if they're on Ethereum, if they're on Binance, maybe they're a BEP-20 token, and so on for EOS, NEO, Tezos, et cetera. The DAI, of course, is an ERC-20 token, and unsurprisingly, the maker governance token is also an ERC-20 standard token. 
Then we move on to the legal dimensions. For the legal claim, we have no claim token, relative rights tokens, and absolute, absolute rights tokens. This dimension was uh, worked on in cooperation with a bunch of our law firms that are our partners. Um, the general idea is that for no claim tokens, these are tokens that pro provide their holder with no right or claim other than the, the right to the token itself, whereas relative rights tokens provide their holder with a certain right towards either the issuer or other third parties involved. So we see relative rights tokens mostly in investment tokens. No claim tokens are usually payment and utility tokens. Absolute rights tokens are the final part of this category. Um, they are tokens that provide their holder with absolute rights. So this is a future looking category, um, which looks to capture, for instance, tokenized IP and other ownership rights in the future. The DAI stablecoin is actually a relative rights token. This was quite the discussion when we were classifying it, but we came to the conclusion that there are enough safe, safe holds in place to ensure that you have some sort of claim against the Maker Protocol or the Maker DAO to receive US dollars in fiat currency against your DAI. The Maker Governance token, on the other hand, is a no-claim token. You have no rights against the Maker DAO or any other kind of entity with this token. Then have the issuer type. So we look at who, who issued the token. Is it a legal entity or is it an entity without a legal personality? So is there a public sector or a private sector legal entity behind this token? Or is it issued by an application layer protocol or a distributed ledger protocol? The DAI stablecoin is issued by an application layer protocol, whereas the maker governance token was issued by a private sector legal entity. Now, it's important to note that this does not mean that maker is a centralized organization or not as decentralized as you might think. It simply means that originally there is some form of legal entity behind this protocol and behind this token. Finally, we have the regulatory status according to the Markets and Crypto Assets Association, uh, Crypto Assets Regulation, which provides an indication on how they could be classified according to this regulatory dimension. So we have e-money tokens, asset reference tokens, and utility tokens. Of course, this is how we see this regulation proposal. Um, this is not the official EU classification that we provide, but we thought it would be very useful to see where tokens would fall in this regulation if it were to be implemented. So the DAI would be a non-authorized significant e-money token. Non-authorized because the Mika is very strict on which tokens would be authorized and which are non-authorized. Nonetheless, it's a significant token because uh, it has a significant market cap and it's one of the most well-known stable coins right now. The maker token is then simply a utility token according to Mika. So this is kind of a quick overview of what the whole thing looks like, economic, technological, legal, regulatory dimension. Um, and we really think that when you classify tokens according to this, um, you get kind of, there, there's a positive impact on the entire market and on all of the market participants. Specifically for issuers, they can use the ITC to communicate token characteristics very clearly, very conveniently towards their users, towards investors and regulators. For investors, it's important they can use it to run market analysis. Once you've classified a certain amount of tokens, uh, you can keep track of the evolving market landscape, and we'll look at some sample statistics later. For regulators, you can use it to get a better understanding of the nature of the tokens and also find a common point of reference for regulatory treatment. Um, very important here as well, the classification according to the Mika, so you can see what it would look like if we really had this regulation in place and how that would impact token markets. Finally, the consumers, pretty much every user of tokens, can benefit from a full classification. You can very quickly grasp a token's key characteristics, and you can also find common terminology for the exchange of thought. For example, um, you know, some people say security tokens. We like to say investment tokens, uh, simply for the reason that securities are defined differently in different jurisdictions, and we would like to be more international, so we call them investment tokens. So what we've done is we've actually classified over 200 tokens from coin market cap. So in November, we pulled the top 200 according to market capitalization, and we've classified all of these tokens. So it's important to note that we're the only people who've really done this. I mean, everybody could kind of come up with a classification framework, but really, really wanted to be used. We wanted to be the best it can be. So the goal was to classify as many tokens as we can to, on the one hand, ensure that there's some value provided, and on the other hand, to go back and look at our classifications and see 
what improvements could be done to the ITC. So we have a full classification of a token here. You can see it's an unpacked payment token. The industry type is payment services and infrastructure. It's a blockchain native token. There's uh, no legal entity behind it. It's a distributed ledger protocol with no claim and it's in scope of Mika. And so if, I don't know, you might be thinking of different tokens. I think the first thing you might think of is Bitcoin, which is true. This is the classification for Bitcoin, but it's also the classification for Dogecoin. So this is just a very extreme example of why it's important to actually go out and classify these tokens, because without actually classifying the top 200 of the coin market cap, you would have never thought that, you know, maybe there's some unclarities or what we've, what we've seen is that there's some key characteristics missing. So, of course, we're not changing the ITC because of Dogecoin, but this was just a, a quick and easy example to show you. So what we've done is we've added more characteristics for version 1.1 of the ITC. We expect to release this by the end of the year. Um, namely, we've added two more economic dimensions, maximum supply and mode of origination. The maximum supply looks at how the maximum supply of the associated token is defined. So is it an inflationary token? Is it deflationary? Is there a fixed supply or is it kind of discretionary to the users or the protocol? Mode of origination looks at the primary mode of origination of the token. So maybe the token is, is rewards based, right? With proof of work, uh, you get the token through mining as a reward for participation. Or maybe there is just an initial token sale or bonding yield curve yield. We then have another legal dimension for taxation. So we want to look at under which taxation regime the token falls. Um, of course, taxation regimes are different in every jurisdiction. So we try to give a very high level kind of overview of where we think this token should be. Finally, we have the consensus mechanism, which consensus mechanism is used to achieve consensus on the distributed ledger. Very straightforward. Is it proof of stake? Is it proof of work? Is it proof of authority? Maybe there's something else. Is it a DAG? So we're now moving on to some st sample statistics from the tokens we've classified. First of all, the technological setup. So we've spoken a lot during this conference. People have spoken about Ethereum and its dominance, first mover advantage, all of this. And you can see now from this to 200 tokens we've classified, 45% of them were ERC-20 tokens. 45% of the top 200 tokens by market capitalization are ERC-20 standard. There's 47% blockchain native, which I think is also interesting. And a trend we've seen is that a lot of tokens will begin as an ERC-20 token with very clear plans on their roadmap to move towards an own, own chain. Next, we have the economic purpose. Of all the 200 tokens, 82% of them are utility tokens. Only 14% are payment tokens, which is a little bit funny considering that, you know, when you look at how, how the media usually covers blockchain, there's a very strong focus on payment tokens when, in fact, the vast majority of the ecosystem we're looking at is utility. And, and I think this will increase further in the future and we will see tokens with more and more different utilities and also see these tokens being used more for the utility as opposed to just for speculation. Finally, we can look at the issuer type. Um, we have 79% of these tokens issued by a private sector legal entity. And this may come as a bit of a shock, especially to the decentralized finance space, um, where we like to focus very much on the decentralization, and it's one of the big benefits of blockchain. Um, and like I said, this doesn't necessarily mean that these protocols are all not decentralized. It just means that there is some form of legal entity behind it. We find this out, for example, by looking for job offerings or the imprints of these companies or the white papers. Like if there's a CEO listed for a company and there's job offerings for five developers based in New York, there's a very high chance that there's some form of legal entity behind it based in New York running this protocol. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open to any questions if we have time. Thank you very much, Max. There is indeed a question, and I'm very happy that it fits so well to the bracket that we actually just closed, but it would be, how does uh, ITSA classify a potential CBDC token? Um, maybe um, uh, answer for both on a blockchain basis, and um, there's also, as we just heard, discussions to not use the blockchain, and, but there would still be a token. How would that work? 
And yeah, how would ICS a classify <laughs> CBDC token? Sorry for the long story. Um, so we're very focused right now on blockchain tokens specifically, so I will go with that. Um, we would probably classify it as a payment token. Um, probably if it's a euro, a euro pegged payment token of some sort. Um, right now there's no specific category, although there is space in the future and that's why it's an extendable framework. I think for CBDCs, once we see them come, it would make sense to add an additional category in the economic purpose um, or the technological setup or the regulatory status to accommodate specifically for CBDCs. The industry would very clearly be payment services and infrastructure. The te technological setup would depend highly on where the token is impl implemented, I guess. There's different approaches, like you said. Um, the legal claim, again, I think if a CBDC has some sort of, you have a right to receive like your real euros in return, then you would say, okay, you have a relative right as attached to the token. Um, issuer type would most probably be a public sector legal entity being some form of central bank. Um, and then how it would fall in the markets and crypto assets regulation, uh, it would be, I believe, an asset reference token, an authorized significant asset reference token or e-money token.